Hello and welcome to The Undercover Story, the history of M&S lingerie. I'm Katie Cameron and I'm part of the team at the M&S Company Archive in Leeds. Today I'll be taking a look at everything lingerie, from bras and knickers to girdles and pantalettes. We'll look at garments from the extensive M&S Archive, as well as marketing and advertising, staff training material and films. If you're watching the preview of this talk, I'm here to answer any questions in the chat just on the right hand side. Otherwise, just drop us an email at company.archive at marksandspencer.com if you have any queries. Today, one in three women wear an M&S bra and the company holds a 37.5% share of the lingerie market. But we've been selling lingerie now for over 90 years. And the story of M&S lingerie is also the story of many women's common experiences, from getting dressed for the day or for bed, to getting ready to exercise or for a night out. We'll start with a quick introduction to the business and to the archive. The M&S Company Archive celebrates the role that Marks & Spencer has played in people's lives for over 130 years. The collection contains over 71,000 items and visitors and researchers can explore the impact that M&S has had on the social history of Britain. From boardroom battles to staff welfare, from puddings to pants, we've got it all in our purpose-built archive and museum in Leeds. The M&S story begins in 1884 when Michael Marx, here on the left-hand side, set up his first market stall in Leeds on Kergate Market. Ten years later, he went into partnership with Tom Spencer and M&S was born. Our first market stall sold haberdashery and household essentials and everything was priced at a penny. And the business soon expanded from market stalls and onto the high street and the range of products increased. The 1920s saw an increase in consumerism. Although unemployment was high, the spending power of those in work actually increased and the cost of living was falling. Many women could now afford to buy ready-made garments rather than making everything themselves, which they may have previously done. In 1926, we opened our drapery department, which included menswear, children's clothes and women's wear, as well as lingerie. A collection of staff bulletins from 1927 gives us an insight into popular products at the time, which included fleecy knickers, free run bodices, cami bockers, which were direct round knickers with poppers that attached to a camisole, and elastic garters, which were apparently an exceptionally fast seller at Christmas. This photograph shows window displays, including drapery, at Liverpool store in 1928. However, we were still selling haberdashery for customers who wanted to make their own garments. For example, fancy garter elastic and artificial silk elastic were sold by the yard as seen in this excerpt from a 1927 staff bulletin, which advised store managers on how to increase sales of elastic. This bra is the earliest we hold in the collection, dating to the late 1920s. The cups are made of a fine artificial silk or rayon fabric with delicate ribbon straps. Uh, the front panel is a, uh, a double layered cotton and elastic from the sides to the back gives a level of flexibility that wouldn't have been possible with earlier bras or corsets. The bra is typical of the late 1920s in that it offers a low level of support with the cotton panel at the front to separate the cups and the elastic panels, yet it still retains the flatter, more boyish silhouette popular that decade. Stockings were, of course, another popular product in the early days of the drapery department. The slightly shorter styles of dress at the time meant that more emphasis was placed on legs. As costume historian Lou Taylor wrote, what had always been part of your underwear was suddenly outerwear, visible to all. In 1928, customers at M&S could buy artificial silk sto stockings in shades including gunmetal, Paris and Florence Mills, a shade named after a popular American jazz singer who died the previous year. These window display photographs from the 1930s show how we promoted these early ranges. Lingerie certainly wasn't hidden away in the store. And as with all window and store displays, sales assistants were trained to make imaginative, creative displays with the products to entice the customers into the store. 
By 1932, our lingerie range had expanded to suit different figures. We offered uplift brassieres that guaranteed a perfect figure and hook sided girdles to give that slim silhouette demanded by present fashions. Bras at this stage were sized only by chest size, not cup sizes. The bras in this advert on the left, for example, were available in sizes 32 to 38 inches. They have ribbon straps and they fasten at the side with hooks and eyes. Customers would have been used to buying a bra and adjusting it at home to fit. We have bras in the archive collection that show evidence of being altered with tiny stitches at the straps or at the cups. The advert on the right, also from 1932, shows a range of slumber wear, shown here in a luxurious bedroom setting with a satin eiderdown on the bed, preempting the loungewear trend of the 21st century, perhaps. The pink and purple pyjama suit on the right was from the Mayfair range of lingerie. It sold for four shillings and 11 pence. And this colour was rather beautifully described as Malmaison and Lupin. The pyjama suits had been popularised in the 1920s by designers such as Chanel and Viennet. Uh, and by the 1930s, they were even being worn out of the bedroom. In fact, in 1931, Vogue magazine declared, a woman may wear pyjamas to quite formal dinners in her own house, to other people's dinners in town and country, if you know them well, and the more iconoclastic members of the female sex even wear them to the theatre. This 1937 photo shows a window display of artificial silk slips. They're promoted as pleasant to wear and that they wash and wear well. Artificial silk, or rayon as it was known, was an early man-made fibre. It was made with cellulose from wood pulp and originally developed in the late 1890s. The fabric was incredibly popular for lingerie as a more affordable alternative to silk um, and a more luxurious option than cotton, linen or wool. Stock control documents show us that by 1939 we were selling at least 30 styles of bra. Most were available in white or peach, sometimes blue, and styles included rubber reducing brassieres and an outsize range. At the same time, we also sold a range of sanitary belts and towels, both soluble and insoluble. Into the 1940s now, um, during the war, many head office teams were moved out of London to ensure that the day-to-day -day running of the department wasn't interrupted by air raids and transport problems. Both the corsetry and the woven underwear buying departments were relocated from Baker Street head office into Leicester. Leicester had a long history of lingerie manufacture and many of our suppliers were based there, so it may have made working life easier for these departments. During the war, there were lots of restrictions on the types and amounts of fabric that manufacturers could use. Austerity measures and the utility scheme meant that designers had to work harder to continue making attractive yet practical garments. Despite this, we were still able to produce glamorous lingerie, like this jacquard satin bra, which carries the utility label. I mentioned earlier about the popularity of artificial silk in lingerie manufacture. And these images of 1940s lingerie show why it was such an important and popular fabric. These garments are all produced under the strict utility regulations, and yet the fabric gives them a luxurious look and feel. The bra on the left isn't dissimilar to the 1920s bra in its structure, but the cups are noticeably more full and have the gently pointed shape popular at the time. The bra is a size 34 and medium cup, so it's an, an early example of cup size. The teddy or envelope chemise in the centre could have been worn under trousers, the proper clothing making it quite a practical garment. We've always helped our customers to choose the right size underwear and before changing rooms were introduced in the 1970s, sales assistants were trained in measuring customers for girdles, bras and corsets on the shop floor. They were encouraged to practice regularly as customers are more likely to have confidence in you if you look as though you know what you are about. This guide to figure types from 1947 puts the majority of customers into one of four body types, youthful, medium, full or outsize, and it gives advice on the types of corsets to be recommended to each customer. We suggested that with practice, sales assistants could sum up a customer's figure at a glance. 
However, we did recognise that some would not necessarily fit into these sizes. So we offered advice on fitting the in-betweens from the frail little lady to the youngster with no figure problems. As you can see here, we recommended that the little old lady needed a boned supporting corset while the youngster just needed a suspender belt. In 1947, we trialled a new way of selling lingerie to make customers feel more relaxed when shopping for a product that some might feel embarrassed about. At Marble Arch store, specially designed counters facing inwards were arranged to give a secluded space where customers felt at ease discussing their corseting problems. The surroundings were enhanced with an elegant wall display illustrating the different types of corset available. And takings went up as a result of the trial because although each transaction took longer, customers were more willing to ask for the service and advice that they needed. Exchanges were down nine tenths as we were able to ensure that more customers bought the correct size. Ensuring that sales assistants knew as much as possible about the garments they were selling was incredibly important. It ensured that customers bought a comfortable garment that fit them and also reduced the number of returns to store. Another training document from 1948 gives information on measuring the hip spring. This was the difference between waist and hip measurements. The document asks, how would you fit Miss Slim and Miss Trim? They are twins at the waist, but not at the hips. Corsetry is full of problems like these, but that's just what makes it so full of interest. And by 1953, we offered customers a range of support from suspender belts and roll-ons to hook-sided girdles and fully laced corsets. The document on the right gives assistance information on each style. For our example, suspender belts were mainly for the teenager, Roll-ons gave gentle support, apparently with complete freedom of movement, while laced corsets were for those who needed strong support to back and abdomen. We saw an increase of customer interest in lingerie in the 1950s, and there were various reasons for this. Customers had more disposable income following the war, and they were more willing to spend it on non-essentials as the decade went on. It would also be likely that customers would have seen glamorous representations of boudoir style in Hollywood films. Additionally, the prevailing style of the decade, nipped in waists and full skirts influenced by Christian Dior's new look, required a certain amount of support and underpinning that only lingerie could provide. In 1953, over a fifth of all bras bought in Britain were bought at M&S. We sold over 125,000 a week. And in the run-up to Christmas 1956, our Leeds store sold 660 pairs of knickers in just over two hours. As I mentioned earlier, in the 1920s and 30s, our bras were sold by chest size alone, so 32 inch, 34 inch and so on. In the late 1940s, we developed our bra sizes to include three cup sizes, small, medium and large, allowing our bras to fit a much wider range of customers, though we still found that customers were adjusting them to fit sometimes. Technology has always played an important part in lingerie development. The strapless bra on the left was advertised in 1953. The panels, boning, elastic and lace worked together to create a supportive yet attractive looking garment. And new fabrics were also quickly adopted by the lingerie department, particularly stretch fabrics and elastic trims. The 1955 Highline girdle on the right provided more support and ensured that spare tyres and ungainly bulges are eliminated. The girdles had very little boning, so were, in theory, much more comfortable than earlier designs. Our corsetry department used new techniques of display and brought lingerie out into the open, resulting in an increase in sales. This photo shows Leicester in 1956. An article in a staff magazine said, until very recently, there's been a lot of hush-hush about these types of garments, but by bringing them forward and displaying them in a bold but dignified manner, the company has been able to take the lead. However, this idea of lingerie being hidden away before the 1950s does contrast with the 1930s photos we saw earlier of the beautiful window displays, which were anything but hush-hush. In 1956, we decided to overhaul our stockings since we started selling stockings, our sizes were based on average leg sizes of American women and average foot sizes of Dutch women, so not necessarily accurate for British women. We had complaints from customers that the stockings were either too baggy or too tight or just didn't fit well. 
1956, we undertook a scientific survey and measured the legs of 600 sales assistants. 17 basic measurements were made on each leg, including knee girth, mid thigh height and toe girth. Researchers also noted information such as the subject's age, what type of work she did and the time of day that the measurements were taken. We have some fantastic photos in the archive showing men in white coats measuring mannequin legs. However, in reality, it was Joan and Patricia of the research department doing all the measuring. So Joan and Patricia travelled up and down the country visiting stars to take the measurements. And once the survey was published, the hosiery teams had a much better idea of what customers' legs looked like, resulting in a new range of super fit, fully fashioned stockings. In 1957, we trialled full body shaping lingerie. This all nylon corselet on the left, which combined a bra and a girdle, was introduced in October 1957 for customers who wanted more control. In the late 50s, girdles and corselets were promoted to all women, regardless of their body type. We encouraged all women to buy and wear some sort of supporting garment. In a 1957 staff magazine, we said, don't make the mistake of thinking that highline girdles are only for the bulky ones. It's a common figure fault, even in slim women, to have an above the waist spare tire that needs smoothing. So thus we ensured that all customers thought that they had some sort of problem that needed fixing. Into the 1960s, and in 1961, we introduced the first tailored slip, quite a revolutionary product in underwear terms. This new garment was necessitated by the increasing popularity of pencil skirts and slimmer fitting dresses. A technical approach was used when designing the slip and even the MS engineering services department were drafted in to help with the design to ensure that the slip took the strain rather than the skirt. The slip was available in black or white nylon shark skin for 14 shillings and 11 pence. Later that same year we began using lycra a perfect fabric for lingerie, it helped make our girdles much more comfortable to wear whilst remaining supportive. To promote the use of these new synthetic fabrics in the late 1950s, early 60s, we produced cinema adverts. These adverts were shown in cinemas before the main feature and stores local to cinemas where the advert was shown would often then have promotions on the products so that viewers could go straight out and buy them. This advert, produced in 1962, promoted Lycra in St Michael lingerie. She is elegant, poised, assured. She is the woman of today with the secret of figure perfection. Her secret? This new lightweight corselet by St. Michael with Lycra. Lycra, the new man-made fibre with spring back stretch. Strength more control than ever before, yet light as gossamer. For every outfit, there is the right St. Michael brown girdle with lycra. Beautifully made, delightfully trimmed with lovely lace. With slacks, the panty girdle with detachable suspenders. A revolution in bras. Bras with stretch straps which stay where they're put. Stretch straps, stretch back. Wonderfully comfortable, superb in wear. A highline girdle from the attractive range for all figure types. St. Michael. Light, medium and firm control girdles. Luxurious comfort with figure perfection. St. Michael bras and girdles with lycra. Only from Marks and Spencer. In 1965, we became the first retailer to introduce a range of coordinating bras, girdles and panty girdles on a large scale. From light to firm control, the girdles came in lace and brightly coloured fabric to match the bras. 
The range was aimed at a younger customer, both in design and price. Each bra cost 9 shillings and 11 pence. The panty girdle range of 1965 focused on the rounded rear. The American-inspired range gave a gentle uplift and was recommended for wearing beneath trousers. In a staff magazine that year, we said, American women have been wearing panty girdles for years, but it has taken a miniskirt revolution and the consequent use of tights for the British girl to start blessing the designer who introduced the gusset into girdles. At the start of the decade, stockings were the most popular type of hose we sold at M&S. Tights were introduced around 1963. They were available in various shades, including the ever popular American tan. By the end of the decade, tights were outselling stockings. In 1971, the ratio of sales at M&S was 80% tights to 20% stockings. And market research showed that across all retailers, stockings now had only one third of the hosiery market. These waist high stockings were perhaps aimed at the customer who wasn't quite ready to give up stockings completely. Sold in 1968, each leg is put on separately, then the waistband clipped together. We'd be very interested to hear if anyone remembers wearing a pair of these. Uh, the pair in this packet clearly went unworn. In 1966, we trialled the bra slip, apparently a highly controversial design. We build it as the hottest fashion tip for the top since the no bra bra. Our designers had seen women in Paris were buying all in one bra slips and so decided to bring the idea home. The M&S bra slip became one of the fastest selling lines of the 1960s. It seems that customers enjoyed the practicality of wearing one garment instead of two and the shorter length suited the miniskirt fashions of the time. By 1968, we had a 40% share of the market for briefs and sold a third of all bras and girdles purchased in the UK. The two garments on the right are a couple of fantastic examples of late 1960s panty girdles held in the archive. More lightweight and less restrictive than earlier girdles, but still offering some support by way of sewn in panels and strong stretch fabric. In 1969, we adopted international cup sizes, A, B, C and D, which replaced the small, medium, large sizes. The new sizes were gradually phased in over the next couple of years. Um, these lettered cup sizes had been in use since the 1930s in America and then were slowly adopted in the UK. In a 1969 staff newsletter, we reported that one of the first people to purchase one of the new size bras was Diana Dawes, shopping in Marble Arch store. And in a very 1960s way, the magazine of course reported Miss Dawes' bra size to its readers. A couple of staff training guides now as we go into the 1970s. The technique for measuring for girdles and bras hadn't really changed by the 1970s. Because changing rooms were only introduced towards the end of the decade, staff continued to be trained to measure bra size on the shop floor under the customer's coat. We can see from these documents that the language used with colleagues is much more practical and informative. There's fewer comments on the customer's body faults, as we called them in earlier training guides. In the 1970s, we saw a return to a more natural shape, uh, both in terms of bras and knickers, with much lighter support. This lace bra in the centre was introduced in 1971 for 73p. 18 months later, M&S had sold a million. It became the best-selling bra in Britain in 1972. It was our first unlined bra, described as less bra during the same job as before. The bra was seen as a prototype for a new style of bra aimed at a younger market, it was made by Lefmans, a firm who'd first supplied M&S in 1929 when they were based in Germany. Time for another advert now. Um, this one was shown on television in the early 1970s, and it shows just how practical our underwear was if you happened to be doing gymnastics. At Marks and Spencer, choose a St. Michael bra, panty girdle, corselet, from a wide range made with lycra for comfort and control. We we'll measure you so that when you move, it stretches with you like a second skin to give you confident fit, confident freedom, confident control, confidence built on the right foundations. Lycra stretch, St. Michael quality, Marks and Spencer value. The photograph on the left shows a display of MS lingerie in Cyprus in the 1960s. 
As well as supplying the British market, we exported lingerie around the world with concessions in chain stores, as well as in St. Michael shops, and by 1975 in standalone M&S stores. Lingerie was a popular range with our international market. In 1975, for example, we exported 180,000 pairs of knickers to Denmark. By 1977, knickers were our largest export. Nearly 4 million pairs a year were sold around the world. Into the 1980s now, an in-store campaign in 1983 called Bras for Today's Woman encouraged women to buy a wardrobe of different bras. We said ladies need at least three styles, a good softly shaped day bra, a seamless bra for the natural look to wear under t-shirts and a deeply plunging glamour bra for evenings. The keep fit boom of the 1980s influenced our lingerie ranges. In 1984, we launched a sports inspired range on the right hand side here, though the range was more sports inspired than intended as sportswear. Again, influence came from America, where apparently sporty undies are all the rage. By the mid 1980s, we were selling bras specifically intended for sports. And by 1992, sales assistants were trained in advising customers which bras were most suitable for exercise. I wanted to share a clip of a training film with you now. It describes some of the styles available in 1985. Uh, and of course, it features some fantastic 1980s hairdos. With a sheer variety available, choosing a bra these days can be a pretty bewildering business. There are light fittings, firm fittings, A cups, B cups, wired bras, seamless bras, bras for day wear, bras for evening wear, even bras for sport. No wonder the poor confused customer needs support in more ways than one. And if the assistance and advice she needs aren't forthcoming, she may do one of two things, buy somewhere else, or take a chance on a purchase which could well turn out to be the wrong one in which case she'll probably bring it back. And we know that seven out of every 10 bras that are returned to us come back because the customer bought the wrong size. So by keeping your eyes open and by offering guidance, you'll not only help the customer to make the right choice first time, but also help us to keep down that costly returns total. Hello, madam, can I help you? Yes, good afternoon. I'm looking for a bra, but there are so many to choose from. I wondered if you could help me. Well, we have light, medium, or firm control bras. Do you know which one you'd like? Yes, I think I would go for a light control. Let me show you some of the more popular styles that we have. That would be lovely, thank you. In the 90s, we developed a new bra fitting service involving much more thorough measurements. Of course, stores had changing rooms by now, so it was much easier to get accurate measurements. Staff underwent two days of rigorous training and assessment to ensure they were giving customers the best service. A huge piece of research was undertaken in 1997 to make our lingerie departments and products more appealing to customers. In the face of increased competition, M&S researchers visited eight countries in 10 weeks, buying lingerie and looking at the environment in which it was sold. Their research showed that customers wanted a warmer, more welcoming environment and to be able to find the type of lingerie they were looking for more easily. As a result, new look lingerie departments were trialled with new fixtures and fittings and merchandise separated into customer types, glamour, modern and classic. In terms of style, the 1990s placed a heavy emphasis on glamour. In the middle of the decade, we were influenced by corsetry and big knickers proved popular. In 1994, we surveyed 500 brides before creating a range of bridal lingerie. So we discovered that brides wanted lingerie that was feminine and pretty, but still practical to wear under various styles of dress and with no fussy detailing. 1994 also saw a new range of plus size lingerie and our first maternity range. This was designed after consultation with midwives, health visitors, and the National Childbirth Trust. Body Sensor Hosiery was launched in 1996, and the following year it won a Queen's Award for Innovation. The hosiery utilised new technology that regulates body temperature, helping the wearer to stay cool when it's hot and warm when it's cold. Post-surgery bras were introduced at the start of the 2000s, 
but customer feedback that the bras were too utilitarian resulted in an overhaul of the range in 2006. The new range was designed in consultation with women who'd had partial or full mastectomies and included more colour, pattern and detailing than before. 10% donation from the sale of each bra went to the charity Breakthrough Breast Cancer and the partnership with Breast Cancer Now, as the charity is now known, continues today. We've often collaborated with external designers for our lingerie ranges. In 1999, the Salon Rose range from Agent Provocateur was launched in store. In, this included bridal and maternity collections. In 2001, Australian designer Colette Dinnigan designed the first Wild Hearts range, a partnership that expanded to include a swimwear and a hosiery range. And model Rosie Huntington Wiley launched her first range of lingerie with us in 2012. The first collection showcased French designed lace, luxurious silks and soft feminine prints. The collaboration continues today, including swimwear, uh, loungewear and a fitness range. And since 2012, the collection has broken sales records. The archive is a great resource for our colleagues in design. In 2016, when we celebrated 90 years of lingerie, designers visited the archive to explore the collection of vintage underwear. They selected the 1970s lace bra that I mentioned earlier. They redesigned it for the customer of 2016. The new bra was available in three colours, underwired and non-wired and with matching knickers. The non-wired version shown here, you can see it differs very little from the original 1970s bestseller. The recent pandemic has seen M&S find new ways to ensure customers find the lingerie they want. At the start of the pandemic, we gave customers all the resources they needed to accurately measure themselves for a new bra. And at the start of 2021, we began offering virtual bra fits where customers could chat to a bra fit expert from the comfort of their own home. And that brings us up to date. Um, I wanted to finish by going back to the 1960s with another cinema advert. This advert is set behind the scenes at a fashion show and gives a somewhat voyeuristic look at our lingerie range from the time. See what I mean? Stressing the fact that it's all Brian Nylon and all St. Michael. OK, fine, I've got that. This is the one with the stretch lace top. In all these new colours. About wanting a definite date. I'll put that rack of double nighties here. Too Well, I adore marks and spots anyway. No marks. Absolutely marvellous value. Blue lace slip together with that lace negligee. It's gorgeous. These are yours, Viv, for the smaller figure. I wear these slips all the time. And Do let me grip. Kathy and the Navy Foundation. Mm, love that. All Brian nylon. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, and this, the stretch lace, gives a perfect fit. Right. Let Mark see these half slips and the lace quilted house coat. Good, good. It's rather me. It's so young looking. Oh, well, girls, the slips first. We're starting. Welcome, Hurry. ladies and gentlemen. And the two half slips. Yes, come. Show of St. Michael Lanchery and, and the two younger styles. Brian nylon. I want those next. Introducing some of the new styles in the current ranges. Slips Quickly, and girls, dresses where's in my next Chama in the red house coat. And shorty Ready? double nighties, featuring mm, dry night lace. That's lovely. Yes, Chami. We follow with a slip and okay. negligee in all over lace. Now the younger styles, specially designed for the smaller figure. We continue with a variety of double nighties with brushed underskirts for warmth with glamour. And the lace too is all bry nylon. And they want the night shirts next. Quickly. And just some of the fabulous colour range of double nighties, all bry nylon at Marks and Spencer now. So that brings us to the end of our talk today. Um, I really hope you've enjoyed taking a look at Vintage m and Lingerie. Do get in touch if you have any questions and keep an eye out for more online events on our website, www.marksintime.marksandspencer.com. Thank you. <laughs>